Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone who has joining who is joining this uh, HIC FEM verification trail webinar. Today we have come to the section number four, water use, and I'm really pleased to be here with you. And we will be spending the next hour together. I hope you can hear me well. And otherwise, please send a message in the chat or in the question function. All right. So my name is Karen Ekberg, and I'm the CEO of Leadership and Sustainability. We have been up and running now for more than six years. We do a lot of strategy work uh, with brands and retailers, and we also work in the supply chain area with HIGFEM, with SLCP, FSLM, with trainings, with SETIHC trainings as well. And uh, you can see some information about me here. Uh, and I just also want to remind you, you will all receive this presentation uh, after the webinar, but uh, th this material is copyrighted. So please just don't go and copy this material. It comes from Sustainable Apparel Coalition, and then also some of the slides are ours from Leadership and Sustainability. And now let's look at the control panel and how to use it. So first, First of all, we have muted all of you in order to make sure that we have a really good audio quality today. And uh, then, uh, but you are really welcome to send us your questions throughout this webinar. And um, we will have time to respond to probably to most of your questions. And if, if there are any questions we cannot respond to today, we will make sure that we follow up with the responses after this webinar. And you will provide, you will be provided a link to the recording and to the entire presentation after this webinar. So rest assured, you will receive everything. And now to the control panel itself. Um, you should be able to see that there is a question box here. And if you open that, you can then type your question here and then you can uh, click to send it. So uh, please, please engage yourself, ask the questions you need in order to make a really, really good result in the water section. And then I also want to uh, make a correction for those of you who joined the webinar about energy and greenhouse gases. We had one question about the deadline for posting the self-assessment. And so you know that the deadline that has been communicated to all of you is April 30th. Um, to post your self-assessment, unless you have a brand who has perhaps asked you to do it even earlier. And now uh, the question was, how important is this deadline? And I may not have put enough emphasis on the importance of this deadline, and I want to correct that right now. So if you are a manufacturer and are an SAC member, or if you are a manufacturer who is producing for a brand or brands, who are SAC members, then the deadline of April 30th is actually really important because it counts, the deadline counts towards membership requirements. And therefore, in these cases, it is a mandatory deadline. So uh, now you still have one full month to do this, but uh, please remember the April 30th, it's not only about the benchmarking, it's actually also about uh, making sure that um, the posted modules are counted towards the membership requirements of uh, yourself as a, as a member of SAC, if you are a member, or for, uh, for the brands that you are selling your products to. Okay, so and I'm sorry for that um, uh, for that mistake I made uh, last time, but now you know uh, how the land lies. All right, good. So the agenda for today, we will just again make a brief recap of the verification trail and the purpose, and then we will dive into the section uh, the water use. We will also give you some water use examples, and of course we will have time for questions and discussion towards the end of the webinar, but you can also ask your questions throughout the webinar, so please feel free to do that. I will also present our team of verifiers to you and our entire team. Okay, the verification trail and its purpose. So the purpose is really to help you to gain a better understanding of the HIG index and HIG-FEM in particular, and its meaning for your company. 
and we will give you section by section guidance through all processes so that you can become acquainted with the requirements that SAC and um, has developed for you within the HIG FEM. We have already uh, completed two webinars. The first one about the facility information and permits and EMS, and then also the section three for energy and greenhouse gases. The process now for many of you are intending to verify your module. So first of all, you need to make sure that you have both the FEM for the self-assessment and the VFEM, the VFEM for the verification. So you need to buy two modules. If you have only bought the self-assessment module, the VFEM so far, you should be able to see on your dashboard in the HIG portal the next available actions. And one of them should be that you can buy the VFEM as well. So please make sure that you do that in order to be able to verify your assessment. I also want to remind you that in any case, you need to buy everything by the end of October. So even if you are going to verify in November or December, please make sure that you have bought your VFEM at the end of October. After end of October, you cannot buy those modules anymore. All right, so your first step is of course to complete your self-assessment and hopefully our webinars will help you to do so. And then uh, you contact the verifying body. It's, um, uh, there is a list available. You can just Google verifier bodies, HIG FEM, and then you will find the list of verifiers. There are lots of verifiers that are approved. And of course, leadership and sustainability are also approved. And I myself, I'm a chemical specialist verifier as well. And in order to make a good calculation for you and being able to estimate the time we will need for the verification, we need some information from you, the type of factory, number of employees, the type of processes you have, if you're using chemicals in your manufacturing, etc. And once we have this information, we can make a proposal to you. And then um, you will make the the self-assessment via the VFEM available to us as a verifier. So this is also something you should be able to see on the platform in your dashboard. You should always be able to see what are the next steps or the next available actions, so to say. So once you have completed and posted your self-assessment, you should be able to see uh, the option to select a verifying body. And that is how you do it. So once you select leadership and sustainability or another verifying body, if you prefer to work with someone else, then um, uh, once you have done that, your self-assessment is being sent over to the verifying body and they then they will assign a verifier for you. Okay, and then the verifier has some work to do to review all your documents, and also let you know if there are any issues beforehand. So for example, if you have uploaded very few documents to the portal, then the, your verifier may reach out to you and ask you to submit additional documents. And uh, the next step is to send an agenda ahead of the on-site or if it's an off-site visit, and then we do the on-site or off-site verification. And uh, one thing that I always, uh, do myself as a verifier and uh, I ask you also to make sure that you uh, that your verifier does that and that is to show the screen so similarly to what I am doing now to ask your verifier to show the screen during the verification so that you can see all changes that are made and you can discuss any open questions immediately with the verifier so don't wait until the closing meeting to discuss um, any issues or any questions you have. You should be able to follow and understand everything the verifier does. It's our task as verifiers to make sure that you feel informed and feel comfortable with the results. You may not always agree, but um, verifiers should always be able to justify um, the uh, results that you have. And as you know, the How to HIC guidance is very comprehensive and there is a lot of information available there and the verifier should be able to point you to, uh, to the respective um, section and show why he or she is doing what he or she does. All right, and then towards the end, we have the reporting and the posting of the results. So once you have received the verified module back to you, 
you can review it. If there are changes that need to be made, you can send it back to the verifier. And as always, you can always see what are my next available actions. And then once everything is complete and, and correct, you can finalize the verification and then post it. So those are two steps. You finalize the verification and you post it. And the final, final deadline for that, uh, for the verified module is December 31st, but the brand, brand or brands you are selling to may have given you another deadline. We know that there are lots of different deadlines that are being used by, uh, by the brands. So please make sure that you are informed about the deadlines uh, from the brands that you are selling to. All right, and I see that we already have a question here. Can we conduct the verification in April? Yes, absolutely, you can do that. As soon as you are finished uh, with your self-assessment and have posted it, you can go ahead and, um, and verify. So we have actually been verifying already since January. Uh, so there are lots of facilities who are very early uh, with, the, with the, their self-assessments. And then so verifications is, uh, are available already now. Good. And then you can also see some guidance uh, from um, SAC about the verification here, if you click this link here. Okay, and then some general advice. So please appoint a person who is responsible and can coordinate all the work with the HIGFEM module. You may have several different persons who are uh, who, need, who need to take care of a certain section, chemicals or wastewater, but you st still should have someone who can coordinate the work with it and make sure that your timelines are met. Then read the How to HIG guidance. It's very rich. There is a lot of information in there. And um, otherwise you might miss points because you are not well aware about what the requirements are. And then there is also verification uh, uh, preparation and that you can have a look at what are, what is the verification protocol and how should the verification be done. Then of course you should respond very, very accurately to the questions. So take time to understand the questions correctly, read the how to HIG and make sure that you uh, respond to them comprehensively. Documentation is very important too. So uh, during your self-assessment, please upload the documentation that is requested. Accept any confidential information. You should never upload any confidential information. Uh, but please upload all other document training documentations, policies, procedures, um, chemical inventories, etc. And sometimes you are prompted to upload them and sometimes not, but for every question it's actually possible to upload documents. Then um, what is also important, and we talked a lot about that yesterday when we talked about the quantitative data management or not, not the day before yesterday it was. So in the energy and greenhouse gas webinar, we also had at the beginning one section about quantitative data management. So if you missed that webinar, you can go and have a look at that webinar and learn more about how to manage your quantitative data. So targets and baselines are important uh, pieces of this, uh, of this puzzle. Then also be aware of the time needed. So if your deadline is now end of April, you should be starting now uh, to complete uh, the module. And you should always start with a facility info uh, or with site info section. Uh, then, of course, it's always the goal to improve. You should really seek to improve every year. And SAC has, from the very beginning, has as, as its mission to support brands, retailers and suppliers to improve on a continuous basis. So, and this is not only about getting more scores, it's also about actually improving your performance, saving energy, reducing the use of hazardous chemicals, reducing the waste generation, and so on. And now the verification trail, the overview, and today we will be talking about the water use. So let's dive into the water use section. And um, here first, we have one question uh, that is related to water withdrawal. And there is, this is an applicability question in the section. And uh, this, uh, these maps here want to show you how severe the water scarcity problem is globally today. So you see the two maps, one is from 1995 
and then we have one projected map for 2025. And you can see uh, that um, the brown colored um, uh, areas here, they have a water withdrawal as a percentage of the total available water of more than 40%. And the beige or light yellow, they have from 20 to 40 percent water withdrawal as a percentage of total available water. So the dark or the brown and the yellow ones are the worst situations because you're, you, they are, these countries are using such a big portion of the total available water. And then the light blue and the blue, they are using much less uh, of the total available water. And you can see the, the change here between 1995 and 2025. And this is, this is really um, uh, scary because you can see, for example, uh, the US had light blue from 10 to 20% in 1995. And now they are projected to have in 2025 from 20% to 40%. So there is a much a more serious situation regarding water scarcity in the American, in the U United States of America. And similarly, you can see in some European countries here. And then, of course, in Africa, you see that more countries now have the brown color. South Africa, as one example here, India has gone from yellow to brown. China has gone from light blue to yellow. So you see that the trend is that there is a much higher degree of water scarcity. So this shows us how important it is in every country to uh, save water, even in countries where you think you have enough water, like in the country where I am now in Germany, but we are still also light yellow already. And uh, so this is the, like the, the mantra for this water section. And now, uh, as an applicability question, you will be evaluating your water risk. And you can do that with two different tools, the WRI aqueduct tool or the WWF water risk filter. And uh, here is a, a screenshot from the WRI, what it can look like. And you just go to this tool and then you add your address and then you will see a map here and you will get the indication what type of, uh, what your overall water risk is. And the dark red uh, it is, the, the more severe the situation. All right. And then uh, also related to the applicability, we have differentiated between light and heavy water users. So light water users, those are the facilities with a low water use, less than 35 cubic meter per day, and facilities that are also located in low water risk areas. So you need to have the both. You need to have less than 35 cubic meter per day and be located in a low water risk area. And then you are so-called light water user. And in that case, you will actually only receive one question in, the in this section, namely the first question, which is about your water, your water source and your water consumption. And on the other hand, if you are a heavy water user, that is if you are using more than 35 meet cubic meter per day and or if you are in a higher water risk area. And now let us see the overview of all questions. So at level one, we actually have only one question and at level two, we have five, at level three, we have one more. So there are not so many questions in this section, but of course they are still uh, very important. And you can also see, you, you will remember that at level one, you can get a total of 25 points, at level two, 50 points, and at level three, another 25 points. And for those of you who are uh, a low um, water user, who only respond to question number one at level one, you will receive 100 points there as a maximum possible. And so the first question is tracking your water sources. So you should first select all the sources of water for your facility. And then you select the quantity of water that you're using, the method to track the water use, 
and the frequency of uh, measurement and then any additional comments you might have. And so the HIC FEM, it automatically converts your water use data into liter and percentage of uh, total use. So it will be, it will always be doing some calculations, so to say, behind the scene for you. And this information will be used to auto calculate your average daily water uh, use to determine your applicability. So that is done uh, by the system itself. And as I said, if your facility site uses more than 35 cubic meter per day, you are a heavy water user and otherwise you are a light water user. And now about flow metering best practices. And this is not such a technical webinar that we will go into all the details for each and every question here. But um, it is important that you have an, a sediment trap or a filter before the water meter so that you don't get um, uh, disruptions by uh, when you are metering. And then also install a check valve to prevent water from flowing backwards through the water meter. So uh, because otherwise also you would have a disruption of the actual value. And then we also have some a rule of thumb regarding the pipe lengths that you should have at least 10, p, uh, 10 pipe diameters in pipe length before the water meter and at least five pipe diameters in pipe length after the water meter. So this is um, because you need to have quite a steady flow in order to be able to measure uh, your water consumption or to, to use the water meter effectively. Otherwise you will have a lot of turbulence uh, in the pipe and that will also disturb the measurement. And now question number two, has your facility set baselines for water use? And we talked a lot uh, in our last webinar about setting baselines for energy and greenhouse gas, but the logic is exactly the same for water use. So you need to consider what makes most sense for me? Does it make most sense to have an absolute baseline or should I have a normalized baseline? And then accordingly, you, should, you will be using uh, the units that are needed, uh, whatever a liter per piece of t-shirt produced or liter per meter fabric produced or liter per kilo or just liter if that is um, if you have an absolute uh, baseline. And I want to give you an example of a normalized water baseline and the calculation, the logic again is exactly the same as for energy and greenhouse gas and the example we gave in that webinar. So here in this case, we have two different water sources. We have municipal water, 20,000 cubic meter per year, and we have well water, 20,000 cubic meter per year. And in total, this gives 40,000 cubic meter. And then on the other hand, we are producing 1 million pieces of textile per year. And now the calculation is the total water consumption divided by our production output. So 40,000 cubic meter divided by 1 million pieces gives us 0 0.04 cubic meter per piece, which is 40 liter per piece. And so the normalized baseline water uses is 0 0.04 cubic meter per piece. Now the baseline for municipal water, the municipal water was only 20,000 cubic meter per year. And then of course the same calculation gives us for municipal 0 0.02 cubic meter per, per piece or 20 liter. And correspondingly the same result then for the well water. And then, of course, this baseline is used then to compare future water use data. So the baseline setting is you do that once for one year and then you should be able to use that baseline for several years ahead. So you should not be recalculating your baseline each and every year, but you say, OK, I am in year uh, 20, um, I am in year 2022 now, but I use the 2021 values as my baseline and I set my goals, for example, to reduce water by 15% by 2025. And then I will use my calculated baseline value for 2021. I will be using that 
each and every year up to the year of 2025, where, where perhaps I set a new baseline and do a new calculation. So that's the idea. So please don't go and recalculate and check how, how did I do, which would be the best baseline year. Take the best baseline year from the purpose of having a good stability in your production and uh, in order to be able to set, a, set a, a challenging and ambitious goal as well, but also, of course, realistic uh, goal. And then, uh, and in order to set a realistic goal, you need to know which processes are the most intensive in my facility. And we, um, even if you haven't, if you are not able to measure all the details, we actually see that most facilities, they have a good understanding of where they are using the most water. So perhaps you have wet process, then that's where you are using the most water. Uh, and in some cases, if you have only domestic water use, then uh, you, you will be using, then your domestic processes are the ones that use the most water. So the question is, does your facility know what facility processes or operations use the most water? And then you will also be asked to give information about which processes that are using the most water. And uh, you should also explain how you have come to that uh, conclusion. So uh, this is important uh, and there are uh, a few different ways you can do this. So you can, for example, have meters installed if you have a good granularity in your measurements of your water consumption and for each and every um, dye machine, for example, you have a meter, then uh, you can use the metered values that you have. Or if you don't have that, you can also use so to say the installed water consumption uh, nominated values for the different machines. Normally you would, you would know how much water they would be using during a normal process. And then you can make your machine list and see what is the nominated values that I have. And then you can also decide where am I using my most water. And obviously you need this in order to be able to set the most important set the goals that focus on those processes that are using the most water. Because if you have a process that is using um, less than, much less than 1% of all water, perhaps you should not focus, start there. You should really try to start where you have the processes that use most water. And then you set your target. So has your facility set targets for reducing water? And um, if yes, you should select all sources of water for which your facility has set a reduction target. So similarly to you know, in the energy section, for the water, all water sources that you have selected, you will get a pre-populated table, first for the consumption values uh, in question one, and then uh, also for the normalized values and now for the water reduction target. So that table always comes pre-populated to you. And here we have a bit of a chart to um, a diagram to understand the decision making process here. So, and this is just an example. So you go through from, uh, from the top to the bottom. So what is the source of water use? First question you ask yourself, can water be eliminated at the source? Am I using water although that is not would not be necessary or is it possible to use my to change my processes so that I can actually eliminate remove the water use and then if you have a yes here you can have a corresponding implement uh, and implement the water saving solution and then you can also move on here can the amount of water use be reduced and if you have a yes here you can also you also have an idea on what to do the next question, can water, wastewater be reduced, reused or recycled? And again, you can then uh, implement a corresponding water saving solution. And then if everything is no, you should still ensure proper management uh, of your wastewater um, and the disposal and discharge of your wastewater. Okay, and then the formal targets for the water, um, they should include a baseline performance value the targeted reduction, for example, 5% reduction per piece, if it is a normalized target, and then the expected completion date, and it should be relevant to the site's most significant sources 
of water use. And um, yeah, the the uh, the normalized, like in this example here, if you have a normalized target, you do that only if you also have a normalized baseline. So please remember that the the, the baseline and the target setting need to be of the same type. So if you have an absolute baseline, you should have an absolute target. If you have a normalized baseline, you should also have a normalized target. We often see during verifications that factories mix and match those, but that is not the intent. It doesn't make sense because, of course, you should always compare your actual result with your target and your baseline. Okay, and then uh, there, is all, there are also some things you should be thinking about uh, more. So, first of all, you need to have the target based on a formal evaluation of improvement opportunities and actions. So, uh, you, should, uh, you should really be realistic in that sense. You need to investigate where you have your highest uh, consumption of water, and then which options do I have? Can I change the dyeing machines? Can I, uh, can I shorten the cycles I have? Can I ask, can I use a, a dual to toilet fl flushing? Can I use tap water that have a restricted flow of the water? What are the technical um, possibilities for me? to actually reduce uh, water consumption. And then you can set the target. So it's very difficult if you just set a target and then you don't know exactly what you are need to do in order to breach this target. So please do a combination of both. Have an idea of what the, what the actions should be. And then you define the exact target expressed as a percent, uh, which could be, for example, 5%. And um, then, you need to decide if the target should be absolute or normalized. And you need to define the start date, which is then where you have your baseline. And you define the end date. As I mentioned, you might have 2021 as your baseline year, and you might have your 20, 2025 as your target year. And then you should define also, of course, the appropriate measurement uh, unit and establish procedures to review the target and ensure that the target is relevant to the reducing the site, the site's water use. And here you have just two small examples of what it may look like. This is not a completed implementation table, but in any case, you have, you have uh, two examples what it may look like. And um, then uh, there is also provided by SAC an implementation plan that you can use, and you can download it here if you click on this link. And then uh, you can you can use that for any uh, for any implementation plan. So it's the same template for energy, for water, for waste, or for any other um, uh, targets that you might have um, developed. And one thing that I think is really important as well, that is that you make sure that you always have at least monthly reviews of your target and your target completion. If you do it monthly, you still have time to, uh, to correct actions, to add additional actions if needed in order to reach the target. So sometimes we see that, um, that facilities, they do only towards the end of the year, you go and check. Um, and, um, uh, and then you see, oh, I'm not going to reach my target, but then you have so little time. Uh, you don't, just don't have enough time to make a correction. So you might need to move that target out to the next year. But um, a monthly review makes, gives you the opportunity to still do uh, corrective actions. All right. So here are some uh, examples of, that of uh, uh, such an implementation plan. You may want to improve your production efficiency. Perhaps you can modernize compressors, upgrade machines, use more sustainable chemicals. We know that there are lots of different dyeing chemicals, for example, that are using less water or need less water than um, other conventional comparable chemicals. Uh, you can also begin uh, harvest rainwater. That will not reduce your water consumption per se, but of course, then you have another water source and not uh, from, 
uh, from the um, uh, from the well, for example. You can also uh, begin to uh, recycle uh, water and use even zero liquid discharge. Um, and I have listed here a few projects that might be interesting for you if you are if you are interested in understanding more about how to reduce your water consumption. Uh, so we have the Swedish uh, Textile Water Initiative, there is the PACT, the Partnership for Cleaner Textile, and then we also have the Clean by Design, which is now run by the Apparel Impact Institute. All right, and then the next uh, step is, of course, to check in and see, did I also actually improve my water consumption? So the question number six is, has your facility reduced water withdrawal compared with your baseline? And you should select all water sources that have been reduced. And uh, when we, as a verifier, come and verify your facility, we will ask to see uh, all your calculations and how you, and all your metering uh, invoices, whatever. And um, and and we will need to follow, be able to follow that you have actually reduced uh, water consumption. So please, and we talked about that uh, in uh, in our last webinar. Keep all reports, keep all calculations, keep all data in one Excel table, year by year, month by month, uh, in order to make sure that you have everything in one place. And um, also make sure that you have the quantities with indication of the units of measure. Sometimes we see Excel tables without uh, the unit of measure. And then, of course, the calculate the percentage change to track your progress. And here is now just a screenshot of what this uh, question looks like. So uh, you will get then for every water source you have. So this table, again, is pre-populated for you with the different water sources you have. And for every water source, you will be responding, has my facility reduced water withdrawal uh, for this source in the last calendar year? And, um, and then what is also important, you should review the reduction data to ensure all aspects are covered and that the information is actually accurate. So uh, we talked about that also uh, in our previous webinar. Uh, it might really be helpful to have someone who can support you, someone in your factory who's good at numbers, uh, who can support you with checking the data. It is always good uh, to have someone else checking so that you have four pair of eyes, uh, two pair of eyes uh, looking. And then you should enter your improvement quantity as an absolute or normalized value. And you should select, of course, the appropriate units for the reduction. And then you should also input the percentage change uh, in the water use. So if you have actually reduced your water consumption, you should enter minus five for a 5% reduction. And then you should also provide sufficient details in the describe the strategies used to achieve this improvement field. So please don't forget that. We very often see very, very short comments there. And I would prefer if we could have more elaborated uh, responses there. And also one other thing, please remember to always write your responses in English. Everything that you write into the HIGEFIA module needs to be written in English. No other languages are allowed uh, to use uh, when you are writing into the free text uh, fields or boxes. And then do not report improvements that are not accurate, that you are not sure about. Do not report improvements that were not achieved in the FEM reporting year. So again, uh, this FEM 2021 covers the calendar year of 2021, which means January to December 2021. And don't report an improvement that is absolute and relates to a decrease in production or reduced facility operations. And that is also one reason why normalization is important. You can still choose. It's your choice if you want an absolute or a normalized value. But if you use normalization, it's much easier to see if you have actually reduced your energy consumption. Because then the normalized values are much less um, dependent on the actual production. And then don't report an improvement that is based on insufficient, insufficient data. And then for us as verifiers, and 
SAC and also Sumera, they are putting a lot more emphasis on the need for us verifiers to check the quantitative data. And uh, it is our responsibility to do that. But of course, we don't know your facility well enough to always know uh, if the numbers are correct or not. So we need to be able to track that and be able to see your, your original um, measurements or invoices. And so the verifiers must review all supporting evidence and uh, then the implemented changes or actions taken to achieve the reductions. And if any inconsistencies or errors are noted, the reported information must be corrected. And of course, you know that if you have already done a verification or been through a verification, we will ask verifiers, we will always revise anything that needs to be revised in the, in the module. So once you have uh, completed and um, posted your self-assessment, you cannot do any changes anymore. Only the verifier can do the changes for you. And the last question, and this is the only question at level three, is the question about water balance. Has your facility implemented a water balance or other analysis to evaluate the traceability of water intake versus usage? And we have, there are quite a lot of requirements related to this water balance. And you can see here, um, you first should identify an analysis and, and sorry, and analyze uh, your water. So you need to understand the traceability of water also within the different departments. You need to understand which processes and machines that have the maximum water use. And um, you also need to make sure that the greater the quality of data captured, the more informed the analysis will be. And then for the actual water balance, you, um, it will help you to estimate unaccounted for water, which means water that is lost somewhere in the factory, but you cannot detect it unless you uh, measure and actually put it into the balance. It enables you also to estimate saving opportunities. And this also makes, uh, makes it possible for you to compare with historical water data and water costs. And that will help, of course, to identify optimization opportunities. And um, I don't know the price of water in your country or for your facility, but what we see is that there is a general trend of increasing costs for all such resources. So water costs will be increasing continuously year by year, as will energy costs. And we are seeing that, uh, unfortunately, right now as well, that the energy costs are increasing significantly day by day. And then um, you also look then at what is my effluent, what is my effluent in relation to my influent, and um, if your water loss is less than 15%, then that be, might be normal. Um, if you have a dye house, for example, that might be normal because you may have um, actually quite a lot of evaporation as well. But when water loss is greater than 15%, then this is indicative of a larger problem. And also I would say, in a facility with only domestic water use, then 15% would also be very high. And I see that we have a question here, so let me have a look. Yes, uh, we have an example of a water balance, so just bear with me. And that, uh, that example comes here. So this is also a bit of a simplified one, uh, but you can see it, it has several wet processes. We have the raw water coming in here with a total of 135 uh, cubic meter uh, per day or whatever. And um, then um, five, five cubic meter comes to, goes to sanitary uh, usage and 35 go here, go here, goes here to the process to dyeing and printing. And then on the other hand, we have a very high water consumption in the boiler. And uh, a, a good portion of that uh, is then uh, actually also being evaporated uh, in the boiler. And then we have here also being uh, water, here's 58 a cubic meter coming out because we are recycling from our wastewater treatment 
or effluent treatment plant. We are recycling water up to the process here. And that's why, so you see it's a bit of a complicated um, flow of the different water streams. And uh, then we have even an ultrafiltration and a reversed osmosis plant here. And in the end, we even have an evaporator. So this is actually an example of a zero liquid discharge plant. But this could be an example of, of any water or how you develop a water balance. According to HIG-FEM, you also need to know the water quality in the different uh, flows, and you can keep that then separate in a separate table. That is, of course, most of the time it would be too much to add into an illustration like this. And you can see here also we have um, um, we are um, recycling the water from this tertiary uh, step in the wastewater treatment plant. Some is going to washing and then is being recycled back into the wastewater treatment plant. And some, as I said, go back to the to the process, to the dyeing. And um, even one uh, portion here goes back to the boiler. And as well from the ultrafiltration and the reverse osmosis, in the reverse osmosis, you will have also uh, a water flow coming out and that goes back to the boiler. So this is what it uh, what it may look like. And if you do it like this, you will really be able to see where am I losing water, if at all. And um, yeah, and then I have just a few examples. And just a second, please. Yes, so on this slide, um, excuse me, and on this slide, you can see here uh, one example of where the water goes. So in this case, the bleaching uh, process actually uses the most. You have the dyeing process as well. Printing uses some, then other uses, and then the boiler. So this is just one example of what it may look like. And then I want to point to um, the NRDC's best practice for textile mills. And this is for all of you who have wet processes. Um, and, and the NRDC, which is now uh, managed by Apparel Impact Institute and uh, with their also Clean by Design program. And uh, they have done a lot of great work when it comes to water and energy savings. And I can only recommend that you download this um, best practice for textile mills. And this table here, you can see, excuse me, actually has some information about uh, the potential for uh, water savings. For example, by, by, uh, by having leak detention, uh, detection, reducing cooling water from singeing, reducing cooling water from air compressor, etc. And you can see here, excuse me, the water savings in ton per ton fabric and the percentage water savings that are, that are possible here. And these examples here also contain some business cases. So uh, you can also see what are the, what is the possibility for us to uh, save uh, costs here. And then uh, we also wanted to um, show you one video. We will not run it here now, but uh, this is one example uh, of how you can save uh, lots of water in your facility. And with that, we have come to the end of this webinar and I would like to open up for questions. So do you have any questions for me about the water section? No questions at all. All right. Okay, you still have one minute or so to send in your questions and I will continue in the meantime. And um, then what I also want to show you, this is um, uh, our team of HIG-FEM verifiers. Many of them are chemical specialist verifiers. And uh, you can see they are, <clears throat> uh, they are based in many different countries. We have a really, really good coverage today of uh, HIG-FEM verifications. And you can contact these persons directly. Sometimes uh, when you click on this link and, and want to send an email, perhaps there is another name behind it because that other person is then taking care of the actual sales process. But um, 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have a really, really good team of verifiers and many of them are chemical specialist verifiers. Many of them are also uh, set at sea trainers and even some are, are also SLCP verifiers. And I see um, we have one question here. Where can I watch the two first webinars? Well, I will actually um, show you where you can uh, watch them, but you can also go to our, uh, to our blog or to YouTube. If you go to our YouTube website, you will be able to find um, the, the first two webinars. Um, yes, so here you see our verifier team and uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, if you have several factories in several countries, you can reach out to me for coordination and uh, and then uh, if you have a specific um, need in one country you can reach out correspondingly to these persons here all right good and then uh, the question was where can i see the previous um, webinars well we will be sending out uh, this presentation and also the recording to you after this webinar, it may be on Monday, uh, it's probably will not be done today, but on Monday, and then you can go and click here, and then you can watch those, uh, those two first webinars, or you uh, go to our website and go to the blog, um, and there you will find these as well, or you go to our YouTube uh, website. All right, and you can also see, you will be able to register here, but you can also, as I mentioned, go to our website and you will be able to find where you can register for, um, for the next coming uh, webinars. And the next webinar will be uh, about wastewater and it will be next Tuesday, so April the 5th, at the same time as today. Uh, no, no, sorry, it will actually be earlier. It will be one hour earlier, but you can see that when you register them. Okay, good. And a final slide showing our global team. And you can see we are growing actually on a weekly uh, basis. We have a really, really great team. We have a team of eight persons here in Germany now. And uh, we have uh, many more uh, persons also available in many different countries. So please feel free to reach out to us if you would like support from us. And with that, I want to thank you so much for joining this webinar. It has been a pleasure to be with you. And I see there are no further questions or so right now. So I hope everything is clear and I hope to see you on Tuesday again. All right. Thank you so much and take care. Bye bye.